previously mentioned, we're doing somewhat of a mini-series involving the Manchester Bridge. Specifically speaking, the bas reliefs that adorn the portals of the Long Gone Bridge. As our friend Histor Dan mentioned in the previous story, those reliefs were designed by artist Charles Keck and were meant to be reflective of the city's historical past and, at the time, industrial present. With that in mind, who were these people, these individuals that were so reflective in Keck's eyes of the city of Pittsburgh's past? To answer those questions, we must start, well, in Pittsburgh's past, with the event that shaped the early settlement of the city and indeed launched our nation on its course towards independence. So today, with the second installment of the Manchester Bridge, we're going to be talking about the first relief, that of frontiersman Christopher Gist and the beginning of the French and Indian War. For a podcast that is focused on the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, for this story, we actually have to start to our neighbors in the South, Maryland. It was in Maryland, Baltimore specifically, that in 1706 or 1705, as sources differ, Christopher Gist was born. His father, Richard Gist, was a land surveyor and is at least partially responsible for the mapping out and plotting out of the city of Baltimore. Although he most likely didn't receive any formalized education, as was the norm for the time, he was trained by his father in the craft of surveying. In 1728, Christopher eventually would have six children with his wife, Sarah. Like many figures from the colonial era, Gis falls away from the historical record for a period of time, only to have his name pop up occasionally. By his father's death in 1741, Christopher Gist is shown to be an accomplished surveyor, explorer, and frontiersman integrated with both the colonial leadership in Maryland and Virginia, but also with numerous native tribes in the region. It's in 1750 then, which our story truly begins. In that year, Gist is hired by the Ohio Company to survey the entirety of the Ohio River Valley from its beginning in modern-day Pittsburgh all the way down to what is today Louisville, Kentucky. It's here that I should probably explain what the Ohio Company is, as they are pretty crucial to the story. The Ohio Company of Virginia was founded in 1748 as a land speculation company, intent on delivering the land of what is today Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, and parts of Indiana, West Virginia, and Kentucky. While it was one of many land speculation companies, land speculation was a shockingly common enterprise once upon a time, the Ohio Company was differentiated by its size and backing. The Ohio Company was comprised not only of several members of the Virginia House of Burgess, including its leader Thomas Lee, but also colonial governor Robert Dinwiddle, whose name is very fun to say, try it. Dinwiddle. Anyway, it also included famed lawyer John Mercer and, quote, all of his majesty's colony of Virginia, end quote. The Ohio Company was, in short, a massive organization with broad political and economic reach in pre-revolutionary America, and they wanted the land of the Ohio River Valley. In order to claim the land, though, the Ohio Company needed to know what was there. So now, let's have Gist rejoin our story. Starting in 1750, Gist was tasked with surveying the land from Shanapin Town, the modern-day neighborhood of Lawrenceville in Pittsburgh, along the river to where it intersected with the Scioto River, or Scioto, I'm not exactly sure, I apologize. Regardless, where the river intersected into the Scioto, Scioto, was where he turned back to home. He was sent out again in 1751 to explore the region of modern-day West Virginia and southern Pennsylvania. By 1753, Gist was the most knowledgeable figure when it came to the exploration of the territory owned by the Ohio Company. Naturally, Gist makes the most sense 
to send as a guide when the territory of the Ohio River Valley comes into dispute. Starting in the 1750s, the French had begun to move into the Ohio country, establishing a series of forts that would allow them to link French Canada with the major French settlement of Nouveau Orleans, or New Orleans. To that end, the French attempted to link Lake Erie to the Allegheny River, to the Ohio, and to the Mississippi, finally, to the Gulf of Mexico. These forts, however, were in the thick of the Ohio River Valley, land claimed by the Ohio country, and vis-a-vis -vis the British Crown. In 1753, Gist was tasked with Governor Dinwiddle to accompany a Virginia militia lieutenant colonel to Fort Le Boeuf at the headwaters of French Creek in present-day Erie County. Upon their arrival, they informed the French building the fort that this was English territory and that they had better decamp. This was news to the French, however, and they politely informed the two Englishmen that they would not be leaving. Much of the trail that these two men blazed to what is modern-day Waterford, Pennsylvania was deemed a historic route in the early 2000s, and if you live in and around western Pennsylvania, I'm sure you've seen the seemingly omnipresent blue signs indicating that you are indeed on Washington's trail. Gist was, of course, sent to escort Lieutenant George Washington to the Ohio River Valley in 1753. And it is for this that Keck chose him. I mean, who better than the guide of the father of America, after all? It's notable, though, because without Gis, it's entirely possible that George Washington never even lives through the encounter, let alone does many of the other things that he would go on to be known for. While traversing through native lands, Washington does encounter a hostile group and is only saved by Gist intervening. The more memorable story of Gist saving Washington, and certainly the more notable one as our story goes, is while crossing the Allegheny River in the winter of 1753. The makeshift wooden raft Washington is using capsizes, throwing the young officer into the ice-choked river. Gist pulls Washington out of the water, in a pretty dramatic scene if both Washington and Gist's journals are to be believed, and then dries and warms the man in order to see him through the night. As a humorous anecdote to the story, Gist and Washington arise the next morning only to find the river solidly frozen over and easily passable. Gist would return with Washington again to the confluence of the rivers, only this time the two men are accompanied by a detachment of British militia, intent on throwing the French out of their forts all along the Ohio country. Gist is with Washington when he arguably starts the French and Indian War by opening fire on French soldiers at the Battle of Jumonville Glen, and again, in defense of the hastily constructed Fort Necessity, Gist along with Washington and the surviving militiamen are released following the battle, return to the Commonwealth of Virginia, now caught up in a global affair, the Seven Years' War, which Winston Churchill famously called the First World War. Gist would continue to accompany Washington to the region, as they were part of the British militia expedition under General Edward Braddock to dislodge the French from the forts. The expedition was an abject disaster, with the British suffering incredible losses, including General Braddock, although that's another story for another time. Gist continued to serve the British during the war, going as far west as modern-day Tennessee scouting for the British and attempting to persuade native tribes to take up arms against the French. This is, however, where our story of Christopher Gist ends as the historical record becomes rather insubstantial. Depending on the reports you choose to read, Gist either contracts smallpox and dies in 1759 during the height of the war, but other accounts, and these are somewhat dubious, have Gist surviving the war, or at least living for a substantial period of time, dying in 1794, although not many historians back that, as 89 years was a pretty good run for the time. For his accomplishments, specifically saving the life of future President George Washington, Charles Keck made Christopher Gist into one of the four figures immortalized in bronze adorning the Manchester Bridge. As a quick note here, I mentioned Braddock's expedition, an infamously disastrous occasion that saw the general lose his life on the northern shore of the Monongahela River in and around modern day Braddock, Pennsylvania. I'm pretty sure you can guess for whom they named that section of town. 
While Braddock is a shell of a town today, a famous example of post-industrial America, it does have one thing. The oldest continually operating steel mill in America, the Edgar Thompson Works of U.S. Steel. Outside of the main entrance to the Edgar Thompson Works stands the statue of a giant steel worker bending a steel rail with his bare hands. The statue is meant to be a representation of the next figure in our mini-series here, the folk hero Joe Magarak, the patron saint of steelworkers. Thank you.